Can we just acknowledge that Truist Park is the dumbest name ever? Uh, Yes, I realize of all the news to begin this program with today, that is probably not the most urgent, but it just still, uh, even 24 hours later, it is aggravating the stew out of me that the, the geniuses at Truist would decide, hey, Let's name the let, let's tell everyone we're going to come up with a name that's going to excite everybody. And everybody sits around saying, hey, maybe we can get Hank Aaron Park or Bobby Cox Field or something. And what do they do? They name it after themselves. What a bunch of liars. Never trust the people at the bank. What a bunch of liars. And then they had the audacity to come out and say that uh, they they focus group this. They field tested it. Uh, they, they got some sort of rate of return on it, that it was it was a great idea. Everybody loved it. Man, people loved this name. It just it, it was perfect. They could have brought everybody in Georgia in, in the southeast of the United States together. And instead, they decided to to go with Truist Park. Whoever came up with this name should be dragged out into the the little area of the battery outside the front gates of, of the field and flogged with wet spaghetti noodles. And the idiot who came forward and said, well, they tested it with the crowd and it was a fan favorite, should have the meatball shoved up his nose. It It is absolutely ridiculous that they went this way. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, but the problem is that they built it up as if it was going to be something spectacular and something great and grand and everybody in Georgia, they're just going to love the name. No, it's stupid. But you know, there is a, there is a side benefit to this. Truest Park. What are the initials? TP. No, we're not going to toilet paper the field. No, we're going to the TP. To root for the Braves and do the tomahawk chop. Yes, that's what it is. Moving forward, we're going to the teepee to root for the Braves. We're going to do the tomahawk chop. We're going to take our tomahawks into the field. Whether or not these little politically correct nimbobs decide that we can or can't, we're going to go in with our tomahawk chops to root for the Braves at the teepee. And from here on out, that's just as I, I have decided to refer to the airport in Atlanta as two dead mayors international airport. We're going to refer to this as the teepee. And we will all be happy and we will forget about it. Now, who is not happy? I will tell you who's not happy. Van Jones last night, the CNN debate, it didn't go so well. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders uh, had a meltdown. Man, the Bernie bros are out to burn CNN to the ground. We will get to that. We got a lot of stuff here. We've also got some folks coming up today. My buddy Cole Musio from uh, the Family Policy Alliance in Georgia at the bottom of this hour is going to join me to talk about the state legislature meeting. At the bottom of the next hour, Congressman Jody Heiss is going to join me to talk about impeachment, which will be happening today. So we need to deal with impeachment. We need to deal with the president's rally last night. We need to deal with the Democratic debate. I want to begin uh, with the the full discussion from Van Jones. Uh, I, we've got the clip, but, you know, and then I saw a more expansive clip of it. And I really I really want to play this longer exchange between this is Anderson Cooper and Van Jones last night uh, after the Democratic debate. If they'll play it. Well, maybe they won't because the internet has decided to be flaky. Okay, let me play this clip and I'll get the longer one. This is Van Jones. But that was, as as a progressive, to see those two have that level of vitriol was very dispiriting. And I want to say that tonight for me was dispiriting. We are Democrats have to do better than what we saw tonight. There was nothing I saw at night that would be able to take Donald Trump out, and I want to see a, a, a Democrat in the White House as soon as possible. There was nothing tonight that, if you're looking at this thing, you say this, any of these people are prepared for what Donald Trump is going to do to us, and to see further division tonight is very dispiriting. <laughs> yes, it is. Now, here's the longer clip. We are back here in Des Moines, Iowa, talking about the debate that uh, the debate that was. Van, was it different than you it was much different than you it was than a lot of us i i have to just say you know i i came away feeling worried for the democratic party i felt like tonight was a night that they were going to all put the fireworks out there you're going to see the best of the best and it just felt like a big bowl of cold oatmeal and i missed i gotta say this i missed andrew yang tonight (laughs) and i miss cory all right who wins the drink And, and i miss cory booker And I miss Kamala Harris and I miss Castro. I miss some of those voices and some of those issues of immigration and criminal justice. There's something that this party's got to figure out. How can it light that fire again? This this felt like drudgery tonight. It shouldn't feel this way close to one of the most important elections in the the country. From your vantage point, 
watching that, no one on that stage, in your I, mind, walked away as that's the person who can go to. I'm, I'm thinking people, I think Trump. about it every day, places like Oakland and Philadelphia, whatever. Can any of those people get excited about what I saw tonight? And I don't see it. And I have to be honest about it. I don't see it. I mean, got- wow. A uh, bowl of cold oatmeal on that stage last night. That that sums it up from Van Jones. Uh, there were some fireworks on stage last night, but l- let me just cut to the chase. If we got a lot of sound bites I do want to play, but let me cut to the chase here. Joe Biden was helped tremendously by that debate last night. He actually talked less than all the other candidates on stage except Tom Steyer. Amy Klobuchar, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren dominated in talking. Bernie Sanders second. Amy Klobuchar next. Uh, Joe Biden was second from the last in time talk. But that worked to his advantage. It worked to his advantage in, in part because he kept stumbling on the stage. And I think it's a mistake to pull out the, straw, the small number of troops. Uh, 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 the, the reason he made the strike was because our embassies were about to be bombed. I would not meet with uh, uh, absent preconditions instead of poking our eye and uh, po- po- excuse me, poking our finger in the eye of all our friends by stealing our intellectual, or stealing our intellectual property, their corporate state system to, uh, uh, to our significant disadvantage of anyone running up here in this race. Reduce the cost of drug, uh, of drug prices. It sets up, it allows all the drug companies, to, excuse me, it allows you to Medicare to negotiate. It should be free universal infant, infant care, but here's the deal. Over 500 miles a day, uh, excuse me, uh, 250 miles a day, there's no oppor- there's no choice but to, for Nancy Pelosi that I think about the American people. I headed up the Recovery Act, which put more money into Fossil, uh, moving away from fossil fuels to to enter to uh, uh, solar and wind energy. If they, the vast majority believe their children will never reach the stage that they read, they they've reached an economic security. Uh, I, every time he talked, he stumbled. Now that was a montage putting it all together, j- just so you get a sense of it. He he stumbled throughout. So it was probably good that he didn't talk the most. Um, and then there was the the Bernie Elizabeth Warren. Controversy. Senator Sanders, you call yourself a democratic socialist, but more than two thirds of voters say they are not enthusiastic about voting this. for a socialist. Doesn't that put your chances of beating Donald Trump at risk? Nope, not at all. And that is because the campaign that we are going to run will expose the fraudulency of who Donald Trump is. Donald Trump is corrupt, he is a pathological liar. And he is a fraud. Now, when Trump talks about socialism, what he talks about is giving hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks and subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Donald Trump is a businessman, received $800 million in tax breaks and subsidies to build luxury housing. My democratic socialism says health care is a human right. We're going to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. We're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. We're going to have a Green New Deal and create up to $20 million saving the planet for our children and our grandchildren. We are going to take on the greed and corruption of the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance company. That is what democratic socialism is about, and that will win this election. Oh, we're going to talk about the the Bernie Bros and the the James O'Keefe undercover footage. I actually, clipped on clicked on the wrong clip there. I, I I thought it was the the different one, the one I wanted to play. But that gets to Sanders doubling down on this. Elizabeth Warren agrees with him on much, but isn't willing to embrace the Democratic Socialist label. And now they're they're throwing him under the bus. Sanders, the, the controversy with Elizabeth Warren came up. Listen to this. CNN reported yesterday that, and Senator Sanders, Senator Warren confirmed in a statement. That in 2018, you told her that you did not believe that a woman could win the election. Why did you say that? Well, as a matter of fact, I didn't say that. Stop, stop, stop. Why did you say that? Uh, And I don't want to waste a whole lot of time on this, because this is what Donald Trump and maybe some of the media want. Uh, Anybody knows me knows that it's incomprehensible that I would think that a woman could not be president of the United States. Go to YouTube today. There's a video of of me 30 years ago talking about how a woman could become president of the United States. In 2015, I deferred, in fact, to Senator Warren. There was a movement 
to draft Senator Warren to run for president. And you know what? I said, stayed back. Senator Warren decided not to run, and I did, I did run afterwards. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million votes. How could anybody in a million years not believe that a woman could become president of the United States? And let me be very clear. If any of the women on this stage or any of the men on this stage win the nomination, I hope that's not the case. I hope it's me. <laughs> but if they do, I will do everything in my power to make sure that they are elected in order to defeat the most dangerous president in the history of our country. So, Senator Sanders, Senator Sanders, I do want to be clear here. You're saying that you never told Senator Warren that a woman could not win the election. That is correct. And, well, CNN is under fire because they acted like they didn't believe him. In order to defeat the most dangerous president in the history of our country. So, Senator Sanders, Senator Sanders, I do want to be clear here. You're saying that you never told Senator Warren that a woman could not win the election. That is correct. Senator Warren, what did you think when Senator Sanders told you a woman could not win the election? (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So, Senator Sanders, just to be clear, you're saying you never told her that. That is correct. I never told her that. So, Senator Warren... When he told you this, <laughs> listen to the crowd. Listen to the crowd. I disagreed. Bernie is my friend, and I am not here to try to fight with Bernie. But look, this question about whether or not a woman can be president has been raised, and it's time for us to attack it head on. Um, And I think the best way to talk about who can win is by looking at people's winning record. So, can a woman beat Donald Trump? Look at the men on this stage. Collectively, they have lost 10 elections. (laughs) The only people on this stage who have won every single election that they've been in are the women, Amy and me. Oh, she went there. She went there. Well, listen, I mean, CNN's got to do this because Bernie is now ahead in the polls and everybody's starting to freak out. Nobody actually recognizes Elizabeth Warren can win at this point. She can't. Uh, but they got to stop Bernie Sanders because they're still privately freaked out about the Jeremy Corbyn thing in Great Britain. So uh, over to Joe Lockhart, President Clinton's former press secretary. He continuing on CNN now this morning. Bernie Sanders probably had the most difficult night because I think the people who matter uh, most who care the most most about this electability issue and women's not being electable are women. And I can't imagine any woman watching last night and saying, I believe Bernie. I think people believe uh, Elizabeth. Uh, and his explanation was not great. But I don't think there's some peril in this for Warren, uh, particularly at the end where it, there appeared to be a little bit of uh, lack of graciousness. There's a reason people haven't gone after Bernie Sanders. You know, this is two elections in a row where people have made the decision to, you know, not really attack him because his supporters are very committed to him. Uh, They are very committed to him. Uh, Did you know that uh, 16 percent of Bernie bros, they call them uh, Bernie bros in Wisconsin, wound up voting for Donald Trump when Hillary Clinton was the nominee? It's enough to hand the election over to to Donald Trump in that state, and in fact, in in a lot of those states, they wound up voting for Donald Trump. It, it is it's it's crazy, crazy. Uh, and the Bernie Bros are something else. We've got the James O'Keefe one. I I, I got to be careful about playing the audio because there's so much profanity uh, by this guy. If you're unfamiliar with Project Veritas, they they do a lot of undercover uh, exposés. James O'Keefe leads them. And this Bernie bro, who's one of his field coordinators, basically saying that that Stalin had gulags and they were a good thing. They've been mischaracterized by people. They were actually to reeducate the rich people, uh, make them break rocks for a few years. And guess what? Uh, they realized they were poor, too. And, and what they had done to other people. And essentially, I mean, he, he didn't essentially say he actually said, uh, if you get in the way of the revolution, you're going to be killed, physically actually murdered. They're going to murder you. And if Bernie's not the nominee in Detroit... Uh, they're going to, or in Milwaukee, rather, they're, they're going to burn the city to the ground. This is a Bernie bro. And this is very typical for what you hear from the Bernie Sanders supporters out there. Uh, and 
the media, of course, has chosen to ignore that. But for how long will they? Because they really do blame the Bernie bros for Donald Trump getting elected in part. I mean, they, I realize they blame Comey, they blame blame Russia, but they really also blame the Bernie bros. How long before the media decides they got to take these people out as a uh, virus within the Democratic Party? I, I suspect we're going to see the media turn on them. Notice how none of them have yet brought up Bernie Sanders writing rape fantasies. That's coming if this keeps up. That is absolutely coming if this keeps up. Hello there. This hour of the program is brought to us by our friends at First Liberty of Georgia. Uh, could not do the program without them. And you probably, once you've used them, can't do business without them ever again. Uh, they're great people. If you're in charge of a business, own a business, and want to grow your business and you need access to capital, but you don't want to go to some some stupid corporately branded something or other with a crap name like Truist, uh, but actually want to go to decent good people... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm still mad about this, this stadium name. But you don't want to use a bank and a bank bureaucracy and the geniuses there who come up with stupid names. Uh, go to the Frost family. Uh, they're wonderful people. They're out of Noonan. Uh, they, if you're listening anywhere in the nation, they can help you, not just Georgia. Uh, but the website is firstlibertyga.com. They're a building loan. They make their own lending decisions. They can help your business grow. Uh, just reach out to them. Tell them I sent you. Tell them I sent you. Uh, they can help you. Firstlibertyga.com. Build Build a relationship with them uh, instead of with, with corporate brand manager nonsense who so take over fields and ruin the names. Okay, we have a lot more to go on the Democratic primary. This is going to be a very busy show today. i got to be intentional with everything. Uh, but I also want to make time for the state legislature. At the bottom of the hour, uh, Cole Musio is going to join me from the Family Policy Alliance to talk about uh, conservative legislation uh, winding its way through the Georgia legislature this year. Um, so we'll be dividing our time. We'll take your phone calls as well. The phone lines are open. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425 is the phone number. Uh, there's a report out from Politico while we're on the subject of the debate. Bernie Sanders' campaign admits anti-war and script was deployed in multiple early states. Uh, the campaign initially attributed the talking points to rogue staffers and supporters, uh, launched an online campaign to convince people the document was fake. The controversial talking points attacking Elizabeth Warren that Bernie Sanders' campaign deployed were given to teams in at least two early voting states on Friday, three Sanders campaign officials confirmed. Volunteers and staffers used the script on Saturday while canvassing for votes, meaning the talking points were more official than the Sanders campaign previously previously acknowledged. The campaign pulled back the script, which described Warren's appeal as limited to the highly educated and financially well-off. That's actually true. Later on Saturday, after the story was published, we have hundreds of employees. Elizabeth Warren has hundreds of employees, and people sometimes say things they shouldn't. But it turns out uh, that it actually was an official campaign document attacking Elizabeth Warren as a candidate with limited appeal. You know, that is she and Pete Buttigieg, that's actually true. Both of them are candidates that rich white people like, and that's about it. Uh, and the Sanders campaign is smart to point that out. Listen, there can be only one alternative to Joe Biden. And right now, the Democratic field is so crowded that they can't distinguish themselves in the pack. So Joe Biden continues to be the front runner. This is very much what happened to McCain in 2008 and Romney in 2012. And frankly, when Trump got ahead in 2016 on the Republican side, once someone really got ahead and started building a base of support, which Bernie already has, but which Joe Biden has in spades with black voters and with uh, blue collar voters and with Obama loyalists, um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have a real hard time trying to build a coalition base that can pick apart from Joe Biden's base and also uh, hold their base together. There can only be one to challenge Joe Biden, and there are so many people in the field, and now you've got Bloomberg out there who's pouring money in, wasn't on the debate stage last night. Andrew Yang is still hanging on out there. 
Michael Bennett alleged James, Michael Bennett got James Carville's endorsement. I, I, I needed to, to, to needle James Carville for that. Um, Bennett, I don't see ever having a chance. Uh, who knew he was still in the campaign? And he's not going to go to Iowa either. Impeachment, by the way, is going to throw a whole wrench in this for the Democrats. But the fields are so crowded, it's preventing consolidation behind an alternative, and that helps Joe Biden, even though he has less money than the other candidates. When we come back, let's look at Georgia for a few minutes, and what are the big conservative items here in the state in the legislature? It is Eric Erickson here. So they've been having the the eggs and issues breakfast this morning with all you can eat Chick Fil A uh, in Atlanta. We will get back to the Democratic debate here in a little bit. I'm waiting for Cole Musio from the Family Policy Alliance to join me as well uh, to talk about uh, the issues he sees coming up in the legislature this year. Uh, so the chamber uh, breakfast this morning. Their big issue is going to be the film tax credit and also stopping uh, major conservative initiatives. You do need to understand uh, your local chamber of commerce tends to be wherever you are in the state tends to be more to the right of the georgia chamber of commerce the georgia chamber of commerce is essentially an entity funded by fortune 500 companies uh which tend to be which tend to lean left and uh, they're big into crony capitalism and they are uh, not very big into social conservatism so they want uh, lots of subsidies and, and breaks for major corporations of the state, and they don't really have a lot to do with Main Street and small small entities in the state. That's that's actually one of my big criticisms and of um, Nathan Deal and, and, and to a lesser extent Sonny Purdue, but really the Deal administration. I, I have a lot of good things to say about the Deal administration. Uh, but one of the major criticisms I had is that I often felt like they were taking policy positions that were designed to help major corporations at the expense of small and medium-sized corporations in the state of Georgia. Uh, why help a Georgia corp- a small Georgia business become a big Georgia business when you could give all sorts of tax advantages and tax breaks to luring an already big business into the state of Georgia? And that seemed to be the approach. Instead of growing Georgia's economy by growing Georgia's businesses, the deal administration seemed to want to grow Georgia's economy by attracting bigger businesses into the state of Georgia. And that put Georgia's own businesses at a competitive disadvantage. And oftentimes the Georgia Chamber of Commerce was right there backing deal in this because you bring in another Fortune 500 company. Well, that's someone else to join the Georgia Chamber of Commerce and give the Georgia Chamber of Commerce money. Uh, it is your it's your your Floyd County Chamber of Commerce, your Habersham County Chamber of Commerce, your your Clark County Chamber of Commerce, Bibb County, wherever you are in the state that really looks after the interests of the the businesses in that community, of of the small businesses and the big businesses in that community. And and there's a disconnect there. There's a growing disconnect over time. Uh, But they had their Chamber of Commerce eggs and issues breakfast this morning in Atlanta on those business issues. And there is a lot of common ground among conservatives. And the common ground among conservatives, quite frankly, is uh, we do believe in a free market. We don't believe in government subsidy. That affects the film tax credit issue because essentially it has become a subsidy of the film industry in Georgia. I know very few people. I I know some. I do know some. But they're in the vast minority of people who want to get rid of the film tax credit. But I know a lot of people who recognize it needs to be reformed. Can it be reformed when you have an obstacle in Georgia? uh, When you've got all the big businesses in the state aligned, a lot of big businesses in the state now also profit from it because they can buy the tax credit from the Hollywood company and use it to offset their taxes. And that's something that's going to have to be looked at. There are other issues in the state as well, including the infrastructure issue. If we go back, I I mentioned the news report from the end of 2019. Uh, The University of Georgia in December of 2019 said they expected an economic slowdown this year. And One of the things they noted is that a lot of people aren't going to realize there's an economic slowdown because Atlanta is going to do just fine. It's going to be middle Georgia that suffers. And the further south you go from the Macon Warner Robins area, the worse off it's going to be. You get down towards uh, Adele and you go out towards Bainbridge and Waycross. You're going to have even more trouble. Get into Taylor County, Macon County down south you're going to have trouble economically in the state. And then in the very northern part of the state as well, you're going to have trouble. 
the problem in the northern part of the state is it is beautiful. It is God's country. Uh, and because there are mountains, there's only so much flat land there to build on. You got to you got to make flat land to build in some cases. And that drives up costs there. But then they're closer to Atlanta. And you get down to South Georgia, there's a problem. You know, uh, Allegiant Air has announced it's going to start regular flights into Savannah. In fact, where is this story? Um, pull up my Slack chat here because my buddy Philip put this in. Um, ba bum bum bum. It is Allegiant Air is going to start. Yes, uh, this is from uh, WMAZ in Macon has this story. Uh, five new nonstop routes to Savannah International Airport. Uh, Allegiant is adding 44 new nonstop routes, including 14 routes to three new cities, Chicago, Boston, and Houston. There's a lot of leisure demand for cities that are regional destinations, and this route expansion will address some of those needs, Drew Wells, Allegiant Vice President for Planning, says. Also, this growth is about Allegiant being true to our mission and our company. To celebrate the largest expansion in Allegiant history, the company is offering one-way fares on new routes as low as... $33. $33. Now, the new nonstops will operate twice weekly coming out of Savannah. So the Savannah Airport is going to grow, which is pretty impressive. Let's see. Um, so from, let me get to the Savannah Airport. I didn't know Gerald Ford had a had a airport named. I'm, I'm scrolling through this list here. So the Savannah Airport, uh, you're going to see... Uh, flights, let's see, uh, Chicago Midway is going to go to Savannah. You're going to have uh, Houston uh, with Savannah. Seasonal routes to Savannah International Airport will include Bellevue, Illinois, uh, Punta Gorda, Florida, Punta Gorda, Florida, Newburgh, New York. In other words, you're going to continue to see economic development in the Savannah area. The airport there is, continues to grow commercially. You're going to see economic development in the Atlanta area. What do you do about the places that are not Savannah and Atlanta? Well, Columbus has Fort Benning, and military money helps stabilize Columbus. What about Macon Warner Robins? Well, you, you've got Robins Air Force Base in, in Macon and Warner Robins, uh, but it's not as as big as some of the other facilities. Uh, you've got this major airport complex down in middle Georgia that is supposedly there's there's development happening, corporate development happening, but not commercial aviation or, or anything of the like there. Uh, where do you go to develop? Uh, what about Perry? What about Ford Valley? And then the other problem you have is if you look at the map of Georgia, while there are highway systems that are growing, you've got this uh, US-80 corridor from Columbus over to Macon. You've got the development along, uh, if you've never been down to middle Georgia, I realize you're, you're, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but they're trying to build some major uh, four-lane connection corridors from Columbus over to Augusta that wrap through middle Georgia to try to help develop traffic. Uh, but, you know, you've also got the Augusta problem. Augusta, pretty big city. And even Augusta is having development issues. You've got the nuclear power plant near there. But this is part of our problem in the state, and it's something that the legislature has to deal with. When all of the state is falling behind except Atlanta, the media in the state, which is so Atlanta-centric, and the Chamber of Commerce in the state and others, they tend to ignore the growing poverty and problems in the rest of the state. And the governor is very actually mindful of this stuff because the governor uh, has – he won – using the support of, with the support of, the people in South Georgia. The governor didn't win in Atlanta, and he knows this, and he knows he's got obligations to the rest of the state. And that's going to shape his policy. It's going to shape his education policy. It's going to shape his taxation policy. It's going to shape his health care policy. It's going to shape his economic development policy. There's a lot of land outside of Atlanta, particularly south of Atlanta, that can be developed. Uh, You know, between my house, so I live in Macon. Um, If you ever drive south on 75, I go from Atlanta down to Macon. And when you get south of Forsyth in Monroe County, there's a huge tract of land there that they turned into a development area. And they've got a, what is it, five below. They've got a distribution facility uh, for that area. And there's a lot of other land there that could be developed. 
But when you get down to middle Georgia, what you find are a lot of distribution hubs. And the reason you find a lot of distribution hubs is because uh, in Georgia, the Savannah and the Jacksonville ports are so crowded and there isn't a lot of development there. So they've built an inland port in Cordell, uh, which is in South Georgia, about an hour south of Macon. And so by rail and by truck, they send cargo to Cordell, and that's where they go through customs and process it. And they can get it on the 75 corridor. They can get it by train. They can get it over to the 85 corridor in Alabama pretty easily by going Highway 80 through Columbus. Or they can go down to I-10, and they can cut across to Tallahassee and and, uh, Lake City. They can go to Jacksonville. They can go all the way to California. The problem, though, is when you get outside of the Atlanta area and you get further south into these distribution areas, there's a Coles distribution facility, there's a Bass Pro distribution, uh, you, you've got uh, a number of other distribution, the five below. The distribution facilities, and now Amazon has one uh, just south of Macon, there's a big Amazon facility that just opened. The problem with the distribution facilities is that they don't pay well. Uh, Typically, the majority of the employees are minimum wage employees. They have a small pool of management people who are better paid. But you don't have the high tech jobs. Now, in middle Georgia, there's an airport there, the middle Georgia regional airport. And they've got an uh, Embraer, I think it's called Embraer, it's the Brazilian airline company. They've got a hub there. There used to be a Bombardier facility there. Before that, there was an ASA facility there before Delta shut it down. And that pays well. There was a Boeing facility there. The Boeing facility has, has been winding down there. So where do you get these well-paid jobs outside of the Atlanta area now, other than Savannah, and to some degree Columbus because of the military situation there? Maybe some in Athens. You get some in Athens because you got the University of Georgia there. Maybe a few in Valdosta because you got Moody down there. But you've got this entire expanse of the state where there are great colleges and universities. You, you got uh, uh, Georgia College and State University. You got Middle Georgia. Uh, you got Georgia Southern in, in Statesboro. But where do you build economic hubs and where can you build aviation hubs where people can go to and get out of other than Atlanta and Savannah and the state? And that's part of the problem. Now, Delta has expanded flights into Columbus and Valdosta, uh, Brunswick and Savannah back and forth. And I believe Albany as well, uh, back and forth to Atlanta. So you can get in and out of the state by getting to a regional airport that then goes into Atlanta. Macon now has a a flight service to Washington, D.C. You actually go into Baltimore. You see, you've got these infrastructure transportation challenges and that are more complicated, and you've got a lot of infrastructure around the state, not in the metro area in Atlanta, that are distribution facilities that don't play that don't pay well, and so you're you're propping up a lot of infrastructure without a lot of depth of, of a tax base there to help it. And the state's really going to have to figure out some economic incentives to stop having people be in Atlanta and start moving them out of Atlanta. There's only so much real estate left in Atlanta. And frankly, you've got huge traffic infrastructure problems in the city of Atlanta as well. So whether it's going up to Rome, which is gorgeous. I mean, man, I I could live in Rome. Listen to those of you up, up on WRGA listening right now. I love your city and I do not get up there enough. You have a fantastic downtown. You've got an a, an out uh, an outfitter store right there on the on the river. Um, what is it, Broad Street uh, in Rome? It, it it's it's wonderful. If you have not taken a, a day or two, get an Airbnb. Go up to Rome. I love it in Rome. I used to go up to Rome all the time. I ran a congressional campaign out of the eleventh congressional district back in the day. And spent a lot of time uh, drinking beer in downtown Rome, running a campaign, and, and lots of coffee. I love it up there. It is fantastic. Uh, and uh, then you've got Dalton, which is close to Chattanooga, which is just exploding. But again, you've got a lot of mountainous land. Where do you develop? When you get down into middle and south Georgia, what you find is is a lot more farms. But farms aren't doing well economically. you got a lot more land to play with. Uh, but frankly, honestly, if we were really honest about it, those of you who know, you know, uh, the, the, the incompetence of the government of Bibb County, uh, down in Macon is phenomenal 
I mean, this goes this goes back uh, generationally, goes back to the Olympics, where uh, the city of Macon in the middle of the state of Georgia with two major interstates connected into it, never even put on an Olympic event in 1996 because the city county government couldn't get its act together. And several years ago, they finally decided to, to consolidate the area in middle Georgia and Bibb County. And they're still freaking incompetent when it comes to stuff that I mean, that they are leaving themselves behind uh, because nobody can get on the same page. The, the whole whole area is fueled with grievance. Uh, you've got an airport there that they've handed over to the development authority to develop. And to some degree, they're developing it and they're bringing in some business. But dear God, um, e- e- frankly, e- the way middle Georgia goes is the way Macon Warner Robbins goes. And if Macon Warner Robbins can get its act together, then the rest of it, whether it's Dublin or Perry or or even out in Gray could get themselves together. If you don't live in that area, you don't understand. Now, if you're north of I-20, you're fairly competently managed. If you're south of I-20, I mean, you, you got to you get into middle Georgia, you got some issues. And that makes the rest of middle and south Georgia suffer because you've got major metropolitan areas that are anchors to those parts of the state that are incompetently run. And that makes everybody else suffer. Why would a Fortune 500 company want to go to middle Georgia when essentially you've got a, a Macon Bibb County government that wants to shake you down? They, they're going to go to Columbus or they're going to go to Savannah. They're going to stay in Atlanta. They're going to go to Athens. And all of this, all this land south of I-20 is ripe for good development and good infrastructure and good jobs. And the government in that area just doesn't help. And they're getting left behind. So now you've got UGA coming out and saying this part of the state is going to get hit with recessionary effects in the next year, and nobody's going to notice because Atlanta's going to be doing really well. And that's unfortunate because that that spillover effect is going to affect a lot of people, and it's going to affect state tax revenue. It's going to affect all of the governor's plans. It's going to affect the desire for teacher pay raises. And the legislature is going to have to do something about it. And unfortunately, as they're meeting with their their eggs and issues breakfast at the Chamber of Commerce this morning in Atlanta, the major Georgia Chamber of Commerce is so Atlanta focused that even they're not paying attention to the issue. And it's going to be the people of middle and south Georgia who are really going to have to take matters into their own hands. Uh, and, And some of them are just going to have to get past past grievances to try to pick it up and move on. Well, I'm afraid Cole was held up. We will get back to Cole and, and go through his legislative agenda. I want to get back into the Democratic debate, having now given you my dissertation on, on some of the problems out there. Um, Mike Bloomberg is trying to get traction during the Democratic debate. He went on Stephen Colbert's show last night. I, I, got it. I have been on the Colbert Report. If you remember Stephen Colbert's original uh, Colbert Report, let, let me tell you how it worked for me, and, and it gives you a sense of how this operates. And I'm sure it didn't operate that way with, with Bloomberg and that Colbert doesn't necessarily do this anymore. But I was interviewed by the Colbert Report to come on. I had just gotten hired by CNN in the end of 2009. It was going to go on uh, 2010 on Colbert. And... They went through an interview with me of all of the topics that might be of interest. And that was the first interview. And they said they'd call back in three days and they called back in three days and they said they had narrowed down the topics to the the three that they thought Stephen Colbert would be most interested in. And so we went through a second interview and we focused on just those three topics that Stephen would be interested in. And then they said, now that they had kind of the outline of the parameters, he only had time to focus on one and they wanted to go, they would call me back after they had met with him in, in the days before the show and they would uh, go through in depth detail with me. And so they went uh, back in 2010, they went in depth issue with me and I can't even remember, I, it was it was the 2010 election and how did I think Republicans were going to be able to leverage that, particularly when people really did need health care reform in the country. And we did a l- probably 30-minute interview on the phone with his producer. And then they flew me to New York. I got into the room. Uh, it was a great room, great people. He's very, very nice. He came in, met with me. Um, this was the topic they wanted to cover. Uh, they spend a little more time. Here's his angle. Here's what he's going to go. I, I get out on set. We sit down for the interview, and it is absolutely nothing about what we had discussed. It was actually personal about me. 
uh, and it completely threw me for a loop. And I, everybody said I did great. They said I did great. It was that that was it was total ambush interview. And uh, he was a very nice guy. His staff were very nice. And I came away feeling like I had been played. And, of course, I, I had been played, given what they had done. And, and he would never, ever, ever do that to a Democrat, I assure you. He would never do that to someone on the left. Uh, he has since gone to CNN, and he's turned political comedy into a thing. He is a man. You know, th- there's something to be said for the number of people in the United States who have made a career off of hating Donald Trump. Now, he's, he made his career before Trump, but it really this, this, this nightly show on CBS uh, for Stephen Colbert, uh, the, where he took over from Dave Letterman, he has made it all about Donald Trump. All of his comedy is political comedy, and, and for the left, who have embraced politics as religion, it works for them for now. But then you go beyond Colbert. You've got this new Lincoln group that has started up. It's a bunch of disaffected Republicans who are out to get Donald Trump and anyone who says anything nice about him. They're willing to burn him down to the ground. And they got some friends of mine who are there. And I don't mean disrespect to them, but I'm shocked by the number of people who are also affiliated who are completely unsuccessful, failed at life. And and the only thing they're good at is preying on the vanities of anti-Trump donors uh, to keep. I mean, whole careers have been built out of opposing Donald Trump. I mean, you want to know why the economy is doing so well? All of these people who could otherwise not work have jobs attacking the president of the United States, and and they owe their livelihoods to him, and yet they hate his guts, and it's deeply ironic. They can't even remember it, uh, can't even recognize it. Okay, a quick time out for a new sponsor I'm actually excited about, but it's confession time in the process of me being excited about the sponsor. So... You know, after all the lung stuff I had several years ago, it took me a long time before I was cleared to actually go back and do serious exercise at the gym. And I finally decided to go back to CrossFit about three months ago. Now, I've been paying for the private lessons instead of going to the open hours uh, because I don't want anybody to see my fat behind working out right now uh, as I'm doing burpees and uh, double unders and all the other awful stuff. Uh, but I'm only going three days a week cause it's expensive to do the private stuff. I gotta have to do something at home cause I got a couple of days a week where I gotta be burning calories when I'm not doing it. And I was really thinking about the Peloton option, but I don't want to pay a ton for Peloton and it's expensive. Well, I discovered Echelon and now I'm really actually pleased that Echelon is a sponsor of the show. It's a live and on-demand studio classes in your home. You can use your iPad. Uh, you can put them on your fitness bike. You can put them on, uh, they've got them on the Apple TV or, or your TV. You can stream it. You can get them on your iPad. They've even got one of the mirror options where you can do the exercises in the mirror. Join hundreds of thousands of people, myself included now, uh, getting fit with Echelon. You don't have to pay a ton for Peloton. You can get an Echelon bike today for under $1,000. So go to echelonfit.com slash Eric Learn about their limited time, free Apple iPad, and complete details of the exclusive offer. Echelon, it's your time. Make the most of it, and don't go broke doing it. That's E-E-E-C-H-E-L-O-N, E-C-H-E-L-O-N, fit.com slash Eric, echelonfit.com slash Eric. Y'all, I'm, if I can do it, you can do it. It's great, and we'll get in shape together. Welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia. The phone lines are open, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Them's the phone number. Uh, It's only one. If you want to call in, uh, more than welcome to. Uh, We've got at the bottom of this hour, Congressman Jody Heiss is going to join me to talk about the Democrats' impeachment efforts. Uh, We also, in addition to the uh, Democrats last night, we had the president of the United States doing a campaign rally in Wisconsin. Uh, It was not quite as white as the Democratic debate. Way more diversity in the Trump rally than on stage of the Democratic debate last night. Here's the president. Bernie and the radical left cannot protect your family and they cannot protect our country, nor do they want to, I think. Bernie Sanders, AOC, all these people, liberal lawmakers are pushing a government takeover of health care that would strip 180 million Americans of their private health insurance. Many of you have great insurance. Republicans will never let that happen. 
politicians, I call them the do-nothing Democrats, support deadly sanctuary cities, demonstrating their contempt, scorn, and disdain for everyday Americans. These jurisdictions release dangerous, violent criminal aliens out of their jails and directly onto your streets, where they are free to rob, attack, and murder American citizens. You have it right here. You have it right here. But crazy Bernie Sanders and the Washington Democrats. By the way, Bernie is surging. Bernie. Bernie is surging. Bernie. But the Democrats are outraged that we kill this terrorist monster, even though this monster was behind hundreds and hundreds of deaths. He's never leaving. They say he's going to win. He's never going to leave. You know, these people, it's called Trump derangement syndrome. It really is. They are. I, I happen to know the guy who started using that term first. Um, he, there's a reason I wanted to play all those clips together without talking between them. Do you get the common theme? Did you hear the common theme? Democrats are too far left and Bernie. Part of me thinks, okay, here's what I can tell you behind the scenes that I know for certain talking to people in the white house. uh, They are more concerned with Joe Biden than the other candidates, or at least they, they have been They're They're less concerned than they had been because of Biden's funding. The president has way more money than Joe Biden and will be able to find Joe Biden. This is going to be a very bitter contest. And one of the major parts of this contest is going to be about uh, driving out the bases. And if it's Joe Biden, the Republicans are increasingly comfortable with the fact that a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters are not actually going to go out and vote for a Joe Biden or an Elizabeth Warren, for that matter. And that puts Joe Biden, if he's the nominee, at a, at a bit of a deficit in the vote. He's got a real deficit in the money. And the Republicans think they may be able to have uh, a level of advantage there. But the president After the British election, where Boris Johnson trounced Jeremy Corbyn, the president and his team are seeing the increase in the polling for Bernie Sanders, and they're looking at it this way. By going on the attack constantly against Bernie Sanders, they could do a Claire McCaskill and make Bernie Sanders the nominee, or... They can so anger Bernie's folks that when the Democrats reject Bernie Sanders in favor of Joe Biden, Bernie's folks stay home. Now, what do I mean by the Claire McCaskill? Claire McCaskill was the senator from Missouri. She's now a talking head on MSNBC. Um, She lost to Josh Howley in 2018 in the election six years before that. Oh, what was the guy's name? Uh, Claire McCaskill wanted a particular Republican candidate because she knew he was most likely to say the craziest stuff on the trail, and there was enough dirt on him that she could take him out. And so what Claire McCaskill did is she started treating this guy as the Republican nominee. And all of her attacks were about this guy. She behaved as if he was the nominee. Um, I'm sorry, this is going to drive me crazy. Um, And I don't have anybody with me right now to, to get the info for me, so I am going to do it myself. Uh, what was it? It was the 2012, and it was uh, Todd Aiken, yes, who's a very nice guy, by the way. I know Todd Aiken. He's a very nice guy. Um, but Aiken uh, went off on the abortion issue and, and creeped people out on, on that and several other things. As she went after him, he was a congressman, and, and Claire McCaskill was able to define him as the Republican nominee when he wasn't the Republican nominee, and everybody started treating him as the Republican nominee, and when the Republicans went to vote, they went to vote, and they went to vote big for him. And as a result of that, oh, and look, uh, I, thank you, Charlie. Um, I, I turned off my text messaging, so I couldn't see my producer telling me the answer, and I had to look it up myself. <laughs> Um, so she was able to define Todd Aiken and in defining Todd Aiken, she was able to get him to be the Republican nominee. And then she destroyed him. 
She knew he was going to say stuff that would turn off the average voter in Missouri, and she made a big deal out of it. She knew the media was with him. She knew the media would give her the benefit of the doubt. They would never give Todd Akin the benefit of the doubt about. And the result was that she got reelected. And part of me is wondering, and there there are rumblings within the president's political team, that this is kind of, kind of his Bernie Sanders strategy right now, to pull a Cla- Clara McCaskill on Bernie Sanders. You make Bernie Sanders now, he's number one in the polls. Bernie Sanders has the most aggressive, loyal support on the Democratic Party side. Suddenly you make him the nominee. And then they go full Jeremy Corbyn. A lot of people miss the Gallup poll from a couple of weeks ago. Gallup uh, used to be Gallup. You know, Gallup stepped aside uh, because they got so much wrong. When was it in in 2012? I guess it was 2014. I can't remember. Gallup decided they were going to stop doing presidential polling for a while because clearly there was something up with their formula that wasn't working. They've retweaked their for their polling model. They're getting back in the game. But Gallup actually does do some very consistent in-depth polling that no one dismisses because they know Gallup does on these issues have a very good track record. It's one thing to do a presidential poll. It's another thing to kind of get the pulse of the American public. And Gallup has uh, historic polling going back uh, decades, going back to like Eisenhower in some cases. And there's actually been in the last couple of years a trend of people more identifying as conservative than than progressive. In fact, uh, progressive has never gotten ahead of conservative in this country. It's gotten very, very close. In the Obama years, uh, progressive and, and conservative were very, very close to each other, while moder- people who consider themselves moderate are always dominant. But among the major ideological groups, conservative leads. And when push comes to shove with moderates, it turns out that moderates tend to lean a little more conservative in their worldview, even though they tend to vote Democrat. You do need to understand this. A moderate tends to be a Democrat and an independent tends to be a Republican in the use of terminology. But when it comes to ideological makeup, most people in this country uh, still, even in the age of Donald Trump, tend to view themselves as more conservative, which is somewhat counterintuitive because in the age of, of Barack Obama, there was a growing number of Americans who considered themselves liberal or progressive instead of conservative. And you would think given that the president polls as badly as he does repeatedly with job approval, that a lot of Americans would reject conservatism because it's so tied to the president. But actually, no, Uh, something like 27 percent of of people say they're progressive and 37 percent say they're uh, conservative. The rest say they're moderate. And that's pretty consistent. And this is a pretty consistent makeup of the American public over over time. And the Gallup voting, the, the, their model now, they use cell phones, they use uh, live uh, landline interviews and stuff. It, the model's solid. And so you've got more people in this country who consider themselves moderate than conservative and more people in this country who consider themselves conservative than progressive. And it doesn't help when you've got Bernie Sanders on the campaign trail saying this sort of stuff, like in the debate last night. Senator Sanders, you call yourself a democratic socialist, but more than two-thirds of voters say they are not enthusiastic about voting for a socialist. Two-thirds of voters. that That's very in line with where Gallup is. Doesn't that put your chances of beating Donald Trump at risk? Nope, not at all. And that is because the campaign that we are going to run will expose the fraudulency of who Donald Trump is. Donald Trump is corrupt, he is a pathological liar, and he is a fraud. Now, when Trump talks about socialism, what he talks about is giving hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks and subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Donald Trump is a businessman, received $800 million in tax breaks and subsidies to build luxury housing. My democratic socialism says health care is a human right. We're going to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. We're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. We're going to have a Green New Deal and create up to $20 million saving the planet for our children and our grandchildren. We are going to take on the greed and corruption of the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance company. That is what democratic socialism is about. 
and that will win this election. And you can't even say democratic socialism, except that's not what it's about. You want a sense of what democratic socialism is about? Look at the Bernie bros who are out organizing for him. They're, they're, so there's a podcast. Uh, it's it's um, Crapo Treehouse, Crap House Trees. I, 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 I honestly actually can't remember. Um, it, it's something Treehouse. And uh, these are the Bernie bros, and they have a podcast. And they are misogynistic. They are anti-Semitic. Uh, they're anti-Catholic. Uh, they want to, they want to hate everybody. They, they do hate everybody. They want to burn capitalism to the ground. They feel left behind. Meanwhile, they're, they're making a lot of money doing this sort of stuff. Uh, and you get a sense of the Bernie bro. I'm sure he listens to that podcast who is one of his field organizers who says they're going to destroy, uh, they're, they're going to destroy Bernie. They're going to destroy or not destroy Bernie. They're going to destroy capitalism. They're going to destroy anybody who stands in their way. They're going to kill people who stand in against the revolution. If Bernie Sanders is the nominee, they're going to burn uh, Milwaukee to the ground on and on and on and on and on it goes. These are not people most Americans want to vote for. And it very much does go to the Cor- Jeremy Corbyn election in Great Britain. Jeremy Corbyn could not get a handle on anti-Semitism for all the talk about Donald Trump letting anti-Semitism in this country off the chain and hate off the chain of this country. Uh, the Bernie Sanders people are, I mean, the, the second coming of the Nazis almost. These people are overwhelmingly uh, white, angry white men. Oh, huh. and, and they're, they're, they're female cohorts. And they want to destroy capitalism. They want to destroy freedom. They want to put you in re-education camps. Uh, Schools are to be uh, vessels of indoctrination, not actually education. And they're very open about it. They are very open about it. Uh, You know, Hitler and Stalin were kissing cousins ideologically. The Nazis uh, believed in the in the the pretend private sector that was completely cold uh, uh, controlled by the Nazi regime. Uh, the Soviets just gave up the farce and controlled everything. But I mean, ideologically, they were soulmates. And you see this when you listen to to the aggressive Bernie Bros out there. You you get this sense. I mean, they're probably still learning German or Russian right now. A lot of them. It's crazy to hear these people. They are genuinely unhinged from reality, unmoored from the way the world actually works. They are convinced that that the free market is bad, capitalism is bad, uh, Christianity is bad, Judaism is bad, uh, religion itself is bad, that, that everyone should believe in the state, worship the state, and Bernie Sanders should be in charge of it, and they're going to burn it all down if he's not. And as these people get exposure, if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, it's going to spook people. Bernie is a man who wrote rape fantasies, and I'm not making that up. Bernie is a man who went into an American grocery store and while praising lines for for bread in Russia as proof that no one would starve, lamented that there were too many choices of deodorant in an American grocery store and it was awful that we had that much choice in this country. Put that man in as the Democratic nominee. Donald Trump will get elected for the next 50 years. And I suspect that's something that the Trump team knows that if they can pull a Claire McCaskill and get Bernie the nomination, they can go full Boris Johnson versus Jeremy Corbyn and ensure the Democratic Party is wiped out. I guess I am supposed to send out a recipe tomorrow, and I'm not sure which one I'm going to send out. Um, But if you want to be surprised and get a recipe, uh, text the word recipe to 33777. Text the word recipe to 33777, and I'll be emailing out a recipe tomorrow. The Speaker of the House has just been speaking. This is a very important day for us. And as you know, I reference temporal markers that our founders and our poets and others have used over time uh, to place us in time, to emphasize the importance of time, because everything is about time, how we use it, how we make, how we uh, mark it. And today is an important day because today is the day uh, that we name the managers, we go to the floor uh, to pass the resolution to transmit uh, the articles of impeachment to the Senate, and later in the day, when we have our engrossment, uh, that we march uh, those articles of impeachment to the United States Senate. 
as I've said, it's always been uh, our founders when they started. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary. When? Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago. Thomas Paine, now are the t- these are the times that try men's souls, the times that found us. Again and again, even, even our poets. Uh, Longfellow. Remember, listen, my children, and you will hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive that remembers that famous day and year. It's always about marking history using time. On December 18th, the House of Representatives impeached the President of the United States. An impeachment that will last forever. An impeachment that will last forever. Yeah, they're going to drag this sucker out. I I was actually talking to a friend of mine who's in Congress last night, and he called me, and I answered the phone, and instead of saying hello, I said, they're going to impeach him again, aren't they? They're just, they're going to keep doing this. They're drip, drip, dripping stuff out. I I don't understand how they can send this stuff to the Senate. The left part us accusations, they came out overnight. We will get into them. And Jody Heiss is going to join me at the bottom of the hour. Um, And he... They're just going to keep dragging this stuff out there. And that's going to turn people off on impeachment. They're going to see it as a political tool. Most people don't care. The media in Washington, I mean, reporters are beside themselves that you don't care. They're beside themselves. So impeachment's going to happen. And with impeachment happening, they are going to send uh, Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee and the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. They're going to send them as some of the managers to go litigate impeachment before the United States Senate. Now, remember, this is a cave on the part of the Democrats because Nancy Pelosi had wanted the rules of impeachment from Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell has refused to reveal the rules. In fact, the Republicans in the Senate are still squabbling a bit over those rules and whether or not they're going to have witnesses in the Senate. And I will tell you, it does now appear that the president of the United States is going to be able to call witnesses, including Joe Biden. Here's Jim Jordan. You can't just let the Democrats get the witnesses they want. I mean, we've already had the most unfair process I've ever seen on the House side. Republicans weren't weren't, weren't given subpoena authority. The president had no due process. He couldn't cross-examine witnesses. Adam Schiff prevented witnesses from answering Republican questions during deposition. So we've had the most unfair process I've ever seen. You can't go to the Senate and say, oh, we're only going to let the Democrats get the witnesses they want if they move. I hope they don't do that. Again, all the facts are on the president's side. I hope they dismiss this and we get an acquittal right away. But if they go to witnesses, you're going to have to have both sides. And we would love to hear from the whistleblower. Remember, 435 members of the House, only one member, Adam Schiff, only one member knows who the whistleblower is. Only one member staff got to talk to the whistleblower. And yet that's the individual who's put our country through four months of this. So if you're going to have witnesses, you're going to have to open it up for both sides and have a have a real fair process at that point. Yes, you are. And I would love for the Republicans to actually call the whistleblower, uh, knowing what we believe we know about him as, as a partisan hack. That would be fun. By the way, this hour of the show brought to you by First Liberty of Georgia, firstlibertyga.com. If you want to grow your business, need a loan for your business, go to First Liberty of Georgia. Great people, the Frost family. Tell them I sent you. And they will help you grow your business, get you access to capital without all the bank bureaucracy. FirstLibertyGA.com is their website. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. Uh, There's a lot happening uh, on today, and I am uh, waiting now. Congressman Jody Heiss is going to check in with us here. And they are actually uh, on the floor, or they're they're meeting right now because you've got the votes that will be happening today. I, let me replay this. I, I realize it's somewhat painful to listen to, but you probably do need to hear it. Uh, this is a, a big deal. Nancy Pelosi naming uh, Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler as the prosecutors in President Trump's Senate impeachment trial. She just had a press conference with them. She's trying to make it sound historic. Uh, no disrespect intended, but um, she maybe should have memorized the speech a little better instead of stumbling around as she did. This is a very important day for us. And as you know, I reference temporal markers that our founders and our 
poets and others have used over time uh, to place us in time, to emphasize the importance of time, because everything is about time, how we use it, how we make, how we uh, mark it, and today is an important day, because today is the day uh, that we name the managers, we go to the floor uh, to pass the resolution to transmit uh, the articles of impeachment to the Senate, and later in the day, when we have our engrossment, uh, that we march uh, those articles of impeachment to the United States Senate. As I've said, it's always been uh, our founders when they started. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary. When? Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago. Thomas Paine, now are the these are the times that try men's souls. The times have found us. Again and again, even, even our poets. Uh, Longfellow. Remember, listen, my children, and you will hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive that remembers that famous day and year. It's always about marking history using time. On December 18th, the House of Representatives impeached the President of the United States. An impeachment that will last forever. An impeachment that will last forever, according to Nancy Pelosi. Um, okay, if she says so. Now, listen, this is something the Democrats are going to use as a partisan weapon. They're going to hold it uh, over their head. Uh, they're going to hold it over Donald Trump's head. They're going to put as an asterisk. Um, But it's not going to be successful. It's not going to be an impeachment where they're able to do much of anything. And, and part of the problem is because they rushed it. Part of the problem is because they didn't do a deep dive in the witnesses they should have done a deep dive on. Part of the problem is there are a lot of witnesses out there that the Democrats needed to engage with, and they chose not to engage with, including John Bolton and others. And it doesn't help that Nancy Pelosi is out there saying, Hey, uh, we tried and we couldn't, um, hang on a second. Uh, I I'm, I'm doing what I told my producer I wouldn't do. And I'm actually texting cause, uh, <laughs> Congressman Heiss, I, I texted him and said, I think you're supposed to be on with me. Uh, and he says he's actually in a congressional hearing. Uh, he will check. Uh, he will find out. I, I, I figured he was probably stopped, um, probably stuck somewhere. And, and there was a miscommunication along the way that that's no problem. We'll get him when we can get him. Uh, and, cause he wanted to talk about impeachment as well, but their whole schedule because of Nancy Pelosi decided she wanted to do this vote on the floor managers has kind of thrown everything for a loop today, including the committee hearings. Uh, not a problem. Um, I want to go to Ted Cruz who yesterday floated the idea to have witnesses. And if they're going to have witnesses to have witnesses the Republicans want. Well, the president has a legal team. It's, it's, it's led by, by the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone. And so Pat and his team of lawyers will be there on the floor of the Senate. They will be able to present opening arguments. They will be able to present evidence. They will be able to, to call witnesses if they choose. And, and it's one of the things, you know, there's all this discussion about witnesses. One of the important things to remember it's not the Senate that chooses to call witnesses. It is the prosecution or the defense, typically, that says, you know, Pat Cipollone stands up and says uh, the president calls uh, Hunter Biden to the witness stand. Now, at that point, the Senate decides, will we allow you to do that? But it's, it's the initial decision of, of the lawyers prosecuting and defending the case, and, and it'll be the White House defense okay, team uh, under, in, in consultation with that. the president. Yeah, he's totally going to get Joe Biden and Hunter Biden on the stand, isn't he? He's going to make sure it happens. Uh, a little more from Nancy Pelosi that I want to comment on. Uh, a couple of things here that she threw out there. On January 13th, reports emerged the Russian government hacked a recurring gas company, Burisma, as part of their ongoing effort to influence U.S. elections to support in support of President Trump. By the way... Uh, 
I haven't wanted to be that guy. I haven't wanted to be that guy. Because I, I, I don't like the the dumb conspiracy theories that people float out there. But there is – she's not drunk. And I see a lot of people, oh, Nancy Pelosi's been drinking. No, I'm not sure what's going on with her. But there's clearly something with her speech that isn't right, and it's recent. And I'm assuming very much like the president has been sick There has been a lot of illness floating around Washington, D.C., and it it sounds like she's trying to keep a bunch of snot from going down the back of her throat is what it is to me. And just yesterday, the House committee, two of our chairmen here, uh, Chairman Chairman Nadler of Judiciary, Chairman Schiff of Intelligence, Chairman Elliot Engel of Foreign Affairs, and Chairwoman Maloney of Government Reform, uh, uh, they... uh, released new evidence pursuant to a House subpoena. Uh, Lev Parnas, you know who that is, an associate of Rudy Giuliani, that further proves the president was an essential player in the scheme to pressure Ukraine for his own benefit in the 2020 election. This is about the Constitution of the United States. And it's important for the, the president to know and Putin to know the American voter Voters in America should decide who our president is, not Vladimir Putin, Putin in Russia. So today I'm very proud to present the managers who will bring the case, which we have. So it's going to be them. And she says that the American voter should decide who's president, not Vladimir Putin. Let me let me ask you a question based on what she's just said. If it's the American voter who should decide, and by the way, she's now she's peddling the the totally uh, debunked theory that Russia got Donald Trump elected. This is a, I mean, Bob Mueller completely undermined this and the media is going to let her get away with peddling the fiction. They would never let Republicans get away with. Look at how they pounce on Republicans all the time over Burisma and, and Ukraine and all that. And here she is peddling this theory that has been totally debunked by Bob Mueller. The media will give her a pass, and she says the American people should decide who's president, not the Russians. Why then let the not let the Repu- why, well, let the voters vote in November? Why do impeachment? Because what she's saying here now is that it should be the Democrats who decide who should be president, not the voters. On that logic, and here's here's Jerry Nadler. Uh, this one's fun. There is an overwhelming case beyond any reasonable doubt. Uh, that the president betrayed the country by using, by withholding federal funds appropriated by Congress, breaking the law in doing so, in order to extort a foreign government into intervening in our election to embarrass, or to try to embarrass a potential political opponent of his. There's overwhelming evidence of that. We couldn't wait because, I mean, some people said, well, you know, let the election take care of it. He's trying to cheat in that election. So it is essential that we bring this impeachment to stop the president from trying to rig, not from trying, he tried, from rigging the next election, from conspiring with a foreign government as the Russian government attempted to, to, to rig our last election. The, over, the evidence is overwhelming. The, the latest evidence... Uh, with, a, with Parnas and Giuliani, makes it even more so. It made sense to wait a while as the more evidence piled up, but we have to proceed because the election, the integrity of the election is at stake. Let me add one other thing. This is a test of the Constitution. The president's conduct violates the Constitution in every single way, trying to rig an election, stonewalling the Congress and saying no one may testify because I can have a cover-up despite Congress. But it's a test of the Constitution now. The Senate is intended by the Constitution to conduct a fair trial. The American people know that in a trial you permit witnesses. You present the evidence. They didn't do that for Clinton. If the Senate doesn't permit the introduction of all relevant witnesses and of all documents that the House wants to introduce, because the House is the prosecutor here, then the Senate is is engaging in an unconstitutional and disgusting cover-up. 
I, I don't even need to play the rest of this clip. According to the United States Constitution, Article 1 of the Constitution says that the House and the Senate write their own rules. Neither House can demand of the other House that it write rules. The Senate gets to set the rules. In fact, the, the Constitution says it is the Senate that conducts the trial. The House managers... There's nothing in the Constitution that requires that the Senate require the House to appoint managers. That's convention from the Andrew Johnson impeachment. But there's nothing that requires the Senate do it that way. Now, just so you do understand here, uh, impeachment is older than the United States. Impeachment is uh, goes back to the English Parliament. There were impeachments in the English Parliament. That's where the uh, American colonists drafting the Constitution, uh, newly freed from Britain, came up with the idea. Remember, part of what they wanted, the American colonists, was to have a Britain and a British system that uh, very much was modeled after the freedoms they thought they had and that uh, the British king, they believed, had corrupted the system and broke the system. So they were wanted to reject a king. There were people who would have gladly made George Washington king, but rejected that system. And they were enamored in going back to the democratic era of Athens and the Republican era of Rome. They wanted a Roman Senate. They believed in that they needed to, but they recognized they needed a house of commons for the people. And and they shaped it as a, as a hybrid between the English parliamentary system that they were familiar with and the ancient democratic systems of, of Roman Athens. And and no reason to call in here and yell at me. We're a Republic, not a democracy, uh, six of one half dozen of the other with, with some general parameters different, uh, because the Roman system had, had a Republican public. The Greek system had democracy, but in practice, they were uh, functionally the same, except the Roman system got out of hand towards the imperial era. Yes, I actually did study this, not just in, in college and not just in law school, but also in seminary of all things. But the fact is that impeachment's been around. We know from the English common law system and the parliamentary system in England before the founder so how they intended to do it. The earliest impeachments were conducted by men who had written the Constitution. We know the pattern and practice. We know about the House impeachment managers, but you don't have to do it. The Senate, according to the Constitution, conducts the impeachment trial. And the Senate, according to the Constitution, drafts its own rules. For Jerry Nadler to come and say this is the Senate, if they don't do what the House wants, is unconstitutional, that in and of itself is a breach of constitutional decorum because the Senate gets to do its own thing. The Senate gets to draft its own rules. It's a bunch of hogwash to say otherwise. But then ultimately, isn't that the point here? The House of Representatives is engaged in a partisan affair. There were more Democrats willing to join Republicans to impeach Bill Clinton than there were Republicans willing to join Democrats to impeach Donald Trump. In fact, they got no Republicans. They made it a partisan affair. They did not do a thorough job. They made excuses for why they couldn't do a thorough job. And now they want the Senate to do the job the House never bothered to do. And the Senate's not going to be bothered to do the things that the House couldn't bother themselves to do. Why should they? And, you know, here ultimately is the problem with impeachment, and this is the most frustrating part with impeachment. All of the people who never wanted the president are yelling more loudly now, but they haven't really changed anybody's mind. If you're going to engage in one of the most solemn constitutional obligations of Congress, the potential removal of the leader of the second article of the Constitution, the leader of the executive branch, you should be able to make a persuasive case. And they've so internalized that Republicans are in a cult, a per, cult of personality and, and can't be persuaded, they haven't even bothered to try. And that's actually not on the Republicans. That's on them. They could have made the case. They could have called John Bolton. They could have called Rudy Giuliani. They could have done all these things for an impeachment trial, and they refused to even fight the fight. And now they're demanding the Senate do stuff they wouldn't do. That's nonsense.
All right. The phone lines are open. We're rescheduling all the calls. Uh, the, the congressman, uh, they wound up having this hearing this morning, having to juggle his schedule around. Cole Musio is going to join me now at the bottom of the next hour. Uh, tomorrow, the lieutenant governor is going to stop by. On Friday, Governor Kemp and I are going to spend an hour together. Uh, you're going to want to be here for that. And uh, Congressman Heiss is going to be here tomorrow as well. The phone number, if you want to be here, if you want to chat, if you got questions about impeachment, about what's happening under the Gold Dome, any of that, uh, all you need to do is call 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425 is the number. 877-973-7425. Uh, we got a lot more we needed to cover, including going back to the Democratic debate. I mentioned in the first hour, Mike Bloomberg bypassing the debate, going on Stephen Colbert's show and uh, being called out for the, the zero-tolerance stop-and-frisk policy in New York City, and he, he's getting lit up today by some progressive activists for how he apologized. Okay, Mr. Mayor, one week before you announced your candidacy, you gave a speech where you apologized for stop and frisk. Yep. What motivated you in that moment, other than the fact that you were about to try to appeal to a broader Democratic coalition? Look, I started out with 650 murders a year in the city, mostly young minority males had to do something about it. Your responsibility is to stop the carnage. Did the best I could. Near the end, I realized we were getting out of control and doing it too much. Actually talked to the woman who's my assistant, sits next to me, has a young son. And we talked about what would happen if her son was getting stopped. And I took a look and said, let's try something. Stop doing the stop and frisk and see what happens. We thought murders would go up. It didn't. So I said, let's phase it out. And before I left office, we'd cut 95% of them out. Then I, somebody said, what did you do? And I said, I made a mistake. And if you can't apologize, I don't know how you live with yourself. Sometimes you just, not everything goes the right, not everything is, goes the right way. Sometimes you do something wrong. Apologize and get on with it. So, yeah, he's apologizing because he's now got to appeal to Democrats who don't like the policy. Here he is on Elizabeth Warren stuff. What people want to know is that you're they're going to get good government. And when I was mayor, I raised taxes on the wealthy, but we spent the money wisely and the crime went down and deaths went down and uh, streets were cleaner. And people don't mind paying taxes if they see they get something for it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Elizabeth Warren's uh, wealth tax? Because you, 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 uh, you have a little it, it bit of cash not, in the bank, I, and I assume cash. that you'd be hit pretty hard by her billionaire tax, you being, you know, billionaire. Now. I'll, have to go, <laughs> I'll have to go and check my account and see if it's still there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so all kidding aside, uh, the wealth tax just doesn't work. It's been tried elsewhere. We have to raise taxes on the wealthy. That's the way you fix income inequality, and that's where we get money to do the things that we need to do that keeps this country safe and keep the economy going. But uh, you don't just go and do it for the heck of it because you want to be mean. You do it because you need the money and you can tell and you're going to spend it wisely. It's amazing the number of Democrats who love the idea of the wealth tax. Uh, we, we need to. Roger Scruton has died. And I want to I want to read you some of what he wrote about this when we come back. Uh, one of the last great conservative philosophers um, uh, of the real conservative revolution in this country. And it's directly relevant to what the Democrats are doing. Give you an eye into this. We got to get back to the Democratic debate as well and a little more of what's happening under the Gold Dome when we come back. We'll take your calls as well. 877-97-ERIC is the phone number. Okay, a quick time out for a new sponsor I'm actually excited about, but it's confession time in the process of me being excited about the sponsor. So, you know, after all the lung stuff I had several years ago, it took me a long time before I was cleared to actually go back and do serious exercise at the gym, and I finally decided to go back to CrossFit about three months ago. Now, I've been paying for the private lessons instead of going to the open hours uh, because I don't want anybody to see my fat behind working out right now uh, as I'm doing burpees and uh, double unders and all the other awful stuff. Uh, but I'm only going three days a week because it's expensive to do the private stuff. I got to have to do something at home because I got a couple of days a week where I got to be burning calories when I'm not doing it. And I was really thinking about the Peloton option, but I don't want to pay a ton for Peloton and it's expensive. Well, 
I discovered Echelon, and now I'm really actually pleased that Echelon is a sponsor of the show. It's a live and on-demand studio classes in your home. You can use your iPad. Uh, you can put them on your fitness bike. You can put them on. Uh, they've got them on the Apple TV or, or your TV. You can stream it. You can get them on your iPad. They've even got one of the mirror options where you can do the exercises in the mirror. Join hundreds of thousands of people, myself included now, uh, getting fit with Echelon. You don't have to pay a ton for Peloton. You can get an Echelon bike today for under $1,000. So go to echelonfit.com slash Eric. Learn about their limited time, free Apple iPad, and complete details of the exclusive offer. Echelon, it's your time. Make the most of it, and don't go broke doing it. That's E-E-E-C-H-E-L-O-N, E-C-H-E-L-O-N, fit.com slash Eric, echelonfit.com slash Eric. Y'all, I'm if I can do it, you can do it. It's great, and we'll get in shape together. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia. At the bottom of the hour, now we got all the, the wires uh, sorted out. Cole Musio is going to join me for a, a dive into the Georgia legislature. Right now, we need to go back to the Democratic debate that happened last night. I will take your phone calls as well if any of you want to call. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425 is the number with digits, if you will. Uh, 877-973-7425. Uh, I, I want to play this clip just because I love the clip. <laughs> this, is a, this is a clip worth playing. This is uh, Anderson Cooper talking to Van Jones. By the way, I know and like both of these men. Um they are both, uh, they're more than casual acquaintances, uh, they're friendly with both of them. Uh, we may disagree with stuff, but y'all, it's important to have friends with whom you disagree on stuff. They're, they're, they're good, fun people to be around. Oh, do I have some stories that we won't get into here because they would embarrass me. Uh, but uh, so here's Anderson and Van Jones talking about the Democratic debate. We are back here in Des Moines, Iowa, talking about the debate that uh, the debate that was Van, was it? Different than you, it was much different than you it, it than was, a lot of us. I, I, I have to just say, you know, I, I came away feeling worried for the Democratic Party. I felt like tonight was a night that I, they were going to all put the fireworks out there. You're going to see the best of the best, and it just felt like a big bowl of cold oatmeal. And I missed. I got to say, bowl this, of I missed cold Andrew oatmeal Yang tonight. Oh, <laughs> I miss, right, I miss, right. And I miss Cory Booker. Right, who wins the drink? And, and I miss Cory Booker. And I miss Kamala Harris. But that that was David Axelrod saying, who is the drinking game? Van Jones has been a big Andrew Yang fan. But listen. I miss Castro. I miss some of those voices and some of those issues of immigration and criminal justice. There's something that this party's got to figure out. How can it light that fire again? This this felt like drudgery tonight. It shouldn't feel this way close to one of the most important elections in the, in the country. From your vantage point, watching that, no one on that stage, in your I mind, don't... walked away as... That's the person who can go to. I'm thinking of people I think Trump. about every day, places like Oakland and Philadelphia, whatever. Can any of those people get excited about what I saw tonight? And I don't see it. And I have to be honest about it. I don't see it. I we got to do better. You got to do better. Oh, but wait, there's more. This this is a little more of Ann Jones from CNN last night. But that was as, as a progressive. To see those two have that level of vitriol was very dispiriting. And I want to say that tonight for me was dispiriting. The Democrats got to have to do better than what we saw tonight. There was nothing I saw tonight that would be able to take Donald Trump out, and I want to see a, a, a Democrat in the White House as soon as possible. There was nothing tonight that, if you're looking at this thing, you say this, any of these people are prepared for what Donald Trump is going to do to us, and to see further division tonight is very dispiriting. Very dispiriting for Van Jones. And, you know, there were a lot of disappointed Democrats last night. The advantages to Joe Biden, Democrats for the longest time has viewed him as the most stable candidate. And it's not exactly so. Uh, he doesn't have the money the other guys have. They're starting to get a little worried that he can be defined as going backwards. And you know, one of the, the ironies here, just as a, from a political strategy standpoint, I, you know, let me, let me step back if you'll allow. Um, well, you have to allow because, because I'm in charge here. It's my microphone. <laughs> um, from a, a, a real truthful standpoint, 
here's what goes on when you do a campaign. Frankly, it's something I need to do for myself, uh, not, not as a as a campaign, but as, as I try to assess how will things shape up for me in the future. I, I probably need to sit down and do this for myself. I used to do it for candidates. You sit down in a room and stop me. You, you, some of you have heard this before, but the audience keeps growing, so it's not repetitious for most. You sit in a room with the candidate and you try to map out uh, their strategy. And the strategy is, uh, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Essentially a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, um, opportunities, and threats. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And then you map out and you decide, who is my chief competitor? And where do my strengths align to their weaknesses? And how can my strengths be used against them in such a way to make me look better? And from there, you essentially develop your theme and how you stand out from the rest of the pack. And every single one of the candidates on the Democratic stage should have known that Joe Biden, by virtue of being Barack Obama's vice president for eight years, and by virtue of leading in the polls even when he was a candidate, he's the guy that you're up against. None of the Democratic candidates bothered to do that. And they should have done that. Because there's a message to tell for virtually all of them, with the possible exception of Bernie Sanders. Whether you're Amy Klobuchar, or whether you're Cory Booker, or whether you're Michael Bennett, or whether you're Kamala Harris, or whether you're Elizabeth Warren, whether you're Andrew Yang, uh, whether you're Mike Bloomberg, whether you're Tom Steyer, uh, whoever it is who's running, and, and there were a bunch of others, uh, Julian Castro, uh, Beto O'Rourke, all of them. The, the name of the game is not to go after each other. The name of the game is to go after the guy who you believe is your biggest rival, and that's Joe Biden because he's in the lead. And the message is freaking obvious. Into a new decade we go. We should not have to go backwards to go forwards. Into a new decade with a new vision we go. We should not have to go back to the Obama administration to go forward past the Trump administration. Into the new decade we go. Voters left Barack Obama to go to Donald Trump. We should not send them back to Barack Obama when we have new visions and new opportunities and it's a new decade and a new world. In to the new decade we go, forward into the future. What was Bill Clinton? Uh, gosh, I was a kid when, but I was a political, I was a nerd when I was a kid. But I was a kid when Bill Clinton was running. What do they do? The, the song they played everywhere is Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Building a bridge to the 21st century, he'd be the last president of the 20th century. Building a bridge to the 21st century, that was the whole Clinton theme. We don't need to go backwards. George H.W. Bush, you were a good man. You were a good leader. Uh, you've let the economy down. No one doubts your patriotism. No one doubts your love of country. No one doubts your competence. But we need someone young to take us into the 21st century, not to go backwards. It was, it's freaking obvious for even Elizabeth Warren can do that. And she's 70 years old. But you know who else can do it? Donald Trump can do it. Donald Trump's younger than Joe Biden, but more than that, more than that, Donald Trump's got this message. And, and the message is, why go backwards to go forwards? I'm leading you. I'm making you safer. The, I've taken out the bad guy in Iran. I've made the economy good. I've got China back to the table. Whether he has or isn't, he's going to say these things. You got more take-home pay. You got a job. Lowest, uh, historically low unemployment for black people. Historically low unemployment for Hispanic people. Historically low unemployment for women. Historically unemployed, low unemployment for white people. Or at least the best since Vietnam for white people. 
Why do we need to go backwards to higher unemployment? Why do we need to go backwards to uh, less opportunity for black and Hispanic citizens? Why do we need to go backwards to a, a more divisive time? Why do we need to go backwards to letting the rest of the world run all over us? Why do we need to go backwards to propping up our enemies and putting down our friends? Why do we need to go backwards to Joe Biden? It is obvious and yet none of the Democrats did it. I mean, you, you got, you've got Pete Buttigieg out there. Who should, he's another one who should be able to do it, and, and he can't seem to be able to do it. Here's Buttigieg from the debate last night. That's why we have to fight climate change with such urgency. Climate change has come to America from coast to coast. We're seeing it in Iowa. We've seen it in historic floods in my community. I had to activate our emergency operations center for a once in a millennium flood. Then two years later, had to do the same thing. In Australia, there are literally tornadoes made of fire taking place. This is no longer theoretical. and This is no longer off in the future. We have got to act, yes, to adapt, to make sure our communities are more resilient, to make sure our economy is ready for the consequences that are going to happen one way or the other. But we also have to ensure that we don't allow this to get any worse. And if we get it right, farmers will be a huge part of the solution. We need to reach out to the very people who have sometimes been made to feel that accepting climate science would be a defeat for them, whether we're talking about farmers or industrial workers in my community, and make clear that we need to enlist them but Mayor in the national project to do something to about To clarify, this. what do you do about farms and factories that cannot be relocated? We are going to have to use federal funds to make sure that we are supporting those whose lives will inevitably be impacted further by the increased severity and the increased frequency. And by the way, that is happening to farms, that is happening to factories, and that disproportionately happens to black and brown Americans, which is why equity and environmental justice have to be at the core of our climate Thank plan. Thank you, Mayor Buttigieg. Mr. Oh, but listen to Tom Steyer, the billionaire who's made climate change his raison d'etre. That's fancy words for reason for being. This deal, because if climate's your number one priority, you can't sign a deal, even if it's marginally better for working people, until climate is also taken into consideration. Look, I've got four kids between the ages of 26 and 31. I cannot allow this country to go down the path of climate destruction. Everybody in their generation knows it. Frankly, Mayor Buttigieg, you're their generation. I think you would be standing up more. I, I, look, I, that's why I'm standing up for it. We cannot put climate on the back seat all the time and, and say, we're going to sign this one more deal. We're going to do one more thing without putting climate first. Going after Buttigieg, the millennial, for not being aggressive enough on climate change. But I do have to say, now, where's this clip? Um... Hang on. I got to find this because it made me laugh that they actually did this to poor Tom Steyer, who really has no business being on the stage other than the fact that he is a billionaire who was able to buy some access. And it's hilarious uh, that he's he's gotten as far as he has inside a Democratic Party that hates billionaires these days. Look, what you're talking about is what's called managed retreat. It's basically saying we're going to have to move things because this crisis is out of control and it's unbelievably expensive. And of course, we're going to come to the rescue of Americans who are in trouble. But this is why climate is my number one priority. And I'm still shocked that I'm the only person on this stage who will say this. I would declare a state of emergency on day one on climate. I would, I would do it from the standpoint of environmental justice and make sure we go to the black and brown communities where you can't breathe the air or drink the water that comes out of the tap safely. But I also know this. We're going to create millions of good paying union jobs across this country. It's going to be the biggest job program in American history. So I know we have to do it. I know we can do it. And I know that we can do it in a way that makes us healthier, that makes us better paid and is more just. 
But the truth of the matter is, we're going to have to do it, and we're going to have to make the whole world come along with us, and it's going to have to be priority one. Climate emergency, yes, but, yes, CNN went there. We're going to have to do it, and we're going to have to make the whole world come along with us, and it's going to have to be priority one. Mr. Sire, to clarify, you say you're the climate change candidate, but you made your $1.6 billion in part by investing in coal, oil, and gas. So are you the right messenger on this topic? I absolutely am. Look, we invested in every part of the economy, and over 10 years ago, I realized that there was something going on that had to do with fossil fuels that we had to change. So I divested from fossil fuels. I took the giving pledge to give most of my money away while I'm alive. And for 12 years, I've been fighting the climate crisis. I've beat oil companies in terms of clean air laws. I've stopped fossil fuel plants in Oxnard, California. I fought the Keystone Pipeline. I have a history of over a decade of leading the climate fight successfully. So actually, yes, I am the person here who has the chops and the history that says I'll make it priority one because I've been doing it for a long time. So in other words, Tom Steyer made his billions off fossil fuels and then resolved to put a whole lot of people out of work. Yeah, that's the candidate you want, Democrats. That that's the guy. I feel like I I haven't spent a lot of time on on Amy Klobuchar who was on stage last night and she had some some good answers but man some of the times she people just were left scratching their head with some of her stuff and I don't know that she's going to be able to get traction now there's going to be a Senate impeachment trial she's not going to be able to campaign it's going to kill off her campaign and a lot of people were mad because she and others on stage last night, they didn't spend enough time firing at Donald Trump. Senator Klobuchar, your response? Yeah, Senator Sanders and I have worked together on pharmaceuticals for a long, long time, and we agree on this. But what I don't agree with is that we, his position on health care. This debate isn't real. I was in Vegas the other day, and someone said, don't put your chips on a number on the wheel that isn't even on the wheel. That's the problem. Over two-thirds of the Democrats in the U.S. Senate are not on the bill that you and Senator Warren are on. Uh, You have numerous governors that are Democratic that don't support this. You have numerous House members that put Nancy Pelosi in as Speaker. The answer is a nonprofit public option. The answer is the real debate we should be having is how do we make it easier for people to get coverage for addiction and mental health. I have a plan for that. And then finally... What should we do about long-term care, the elephant that doesn't even fit in this room? We need to make it easier for people to get long-term care insurance. We need to make it easier for them to pay for their premiums. Uh, My own dad, I know when his long-term care insurance ends. And then we have some savings for him. He's in assisted living. Uh, He got married three times, whole other story, so there isn't much there. But... Then we go to Medicaid, and I've already Thank talked you. to Catholic Elder Care. They're willing to take him in. Our story is better than so many other families. We have to make it easier for long-term care. It's Thank not you. just Thank for you, seniors. Senator it's also for the sandwich generation, Thank you, Senator people trying to help their parents. Senator Warren. The, the what? Yeah, see, this is a lot of people were listening to Amy Klobuchar last night, l- scratching her head that is she offering? No, this is, this is actually Amy Klobuchar, and you've got a lot of the stories out there about about Klobuchar doing things like eating her. And, and, you know, I thought she handled this one well, eating the the salad with the comb, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, it was it was a story that was supposed to make her look bad. I thought it kind of made her look good. But berating her staff and all, she's very much a perfectionist. She does get along with Republicans in the Senate. But uh, n- even a lot of the Democrats behind the scenes whisper, yeah, she comes across great. But behind the scenes, her organizational stuff isn't great in her, and you can kind of get a sense of that in her, her answer there, which the organizational skills of that answer were kind of on display and a little bit appalling. Um, then, of course, well, there's Bernie Sanders, who right now is leading Joe Biden in the polls in Iowa and New Hampshire. Joe Biden still probably going to be the nominee because of black voters in the South. But Bernie, some of these these white people in college campuses, they they love him a lot. Senator Sanders, you have said that New Deal, the USMCA, quote, make some modest improvements, yet you're going to vote against it. Aren't modest improvements better than no improvements no, for the farmers much, and manufacturers who have been devastated here in Iowa? The answer is we could do much better than a Trump-led uh, trade deal. Uh, 
this deal, and I think the proponents of it acknowledge, will result in the continuation of the loss of hundreds of thousands of good-paying jobs as a result of outsourcing. The heart and soul of our disaster trade agreements, and I'm the guy who voted against NAFTA and against permanent normal trade relations with China, is that we have forced American workers to compete against people in Mexico, in China, elsewhere, who earn starvation wages, a dollar or two dollars an hour. Second of all, every major environmental organization has said no to this new trade agreement because it does not even have the phrase climate change in it. And given the fact that climate change is right now the greatest threat facing this planet, I will not vote for a trade agreement that does not incorporate very, very strong principles to significantly lower fossil fuel emissions uh, in the world. But Senator Sanders, to be clear, the AFL-CIO supports this deal. Are you unwilling to compromise? The AFL-CIO does. The Machinist Union does not. And every environmental organization in this country, uh, including the Sunrise Organization, who are supporting my candidacy, opposes it. So I happen to believe, and I hope we will talk about climate change in a moment. If we do not get our act together in terms of climate change, the planet that we're going to be leaving our kids and our children and our grandchildren will be increasingly unlivable. You know, here's the problem. Democrats care deeply about climate change and no one else really does. And this is his defining issue. He's going to go to Trump on this and quote these left-wing radicals. It's going to hurt him pretty bad in the general election if he's the nominee. We have done the dive into impeachment. We have done the dive into the Democratic debate. Now we need to dive into the Georgia legislature. Joining me, my buddy Cole Musio from the Family Policy Alliance here in Georgia. I think this is my first time having you on. Welcome. Hey, brother. How you doing, man? Good, good. Thanks for joining me here uh, on the morning show. So I I, I know they had eggs and issues this morning with the chamber, but I I wanted to talk to an actual conservative about the conservative issues that are going to be headed to the legislature. And (laughs) how do you see things shaping up this year? You know, it's it's going to be an interesting session. There's some great opportunities to do some good things, uh, but there's going to be a lot of, I've told people a few times, I think the people that will like this session the most are going to be people that are accountants and sausage makers because it's going to be a nitty gritty kind of session with a lot of look at the budget. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's some real threats to the state as well, particularly with the casino gambling issue, uh, rearing its ugly head back up as well. Well, let's talk about the casino for a minute, because I know there are some people who they, they like to gamble. They like to go to Vegas. I like to go to Vegas, but I don't like to gamble. Uh, I don't like to waste my hard earned money. Um, I, I do believe it was Kasim Reed who, one of the few things I agreed with him on was saying there's a reason Vegas is in a desert and there seems to be this yeah. drive, uh, by some people to bring casinos into to the state of Georgia and essentially uh, say, we're just going to let the voters decide on the issue, knowing the voters would, of course, side with a casino, but where to put it in? You've got the issue in, in Atlanta now. you got a lot of the entertainment venues are thinking uh, they're toast if you bring a casino in. It's, it's bad policy all around. I mean, it's fraudulent math. You know, first of all, it doesn't solve revenue problems. In fact, the state will spend about $3 for every $1 that it brings in. And the governor and, and lieutenant governor and first lady, the, there's a tremendous push to fight the evil of human trafficking. Casinos, time and time again, prove to be a magnet for such activity. Why do we want to bring that into our state? It's not going to solve revenue problems. It's going to scare away business. It's going to harm existing businesses. It's going to destroy community. If, it, if, it puts, if, if you put a casino in your community, it's going to destroy your home value. You're going to be moving. You know, it, it's a, it is a bad idea all around, and it's completely irresponsible for legislators to consider putting that uh, question to the people. This is why we elect representatives, to do things and take hard stances that they know are right for our state. Uh, what's going to happen if you put this on the ballot is you're going to get tens of millions of dollars c- from casinos that have a profit motive uh, to push you know, fraudulent information on the people of the state of Georgia. And it's not going to be a fair vote. So we're counting on folks to do their job that we've elected them to do to represent our state and do the right thing and oppose this. Well, you know, you, you say that and, and there are ample studies and, and being a native of Louisiana, I, I know firsthand. And now Illinois and Massachusetts and, and Maryland are all dealing with this. They do pour a bunch of money in to build these fantastic facilities. 
uh, for casino gambling. Uh, the legislators love it. They go hang out there, but they don't actually solve the budget crisis for education. And in fact, in Louisiana and Illinois, they wound up still having to raise taxes for education because the casinos didn't do what they did. Essentially, you've got state legislators who believe they can beat the House odds and no one ever beats the House odds. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know, you talk about legislators wanting to go there. Imagine, uh, and we're already seeing some of this, but imagine a state where you have a casino interest that is here. Imagine how much that's going to affect politics in terms of the money being thrown around and the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are flooding the, uh, to the candidates that are pro-casino and uh, opposing those that are against it. Uh, it's, it's going to be this whole new big industry here in the state of Georgia that's going to have profound impact on all our politics. It's, it's, it's bad news all, all the way around doesn't solve the problem, brings in additional problems, and and really hurts Georgians. Now, let's move on from casinos. I know one of the big issues the governor wants to deal with is this urban-rural divide. You've got the University of Georgia projecting that uh, places south of I-20 are probably going to slip into a recessionary-like sequence while the Atlanta area thrives, and and people don't forget. And, and I know the Family Policy Alliance, you, you guys have a lot of folks in the Atlanta area. And, and now this show, I, I can give you some exposure outside of Atlanta as, as we're spreading around the state. Uh, but it, there that. are a lot of conservative uh, social issues as well that kind of get ignored when we get into this budgetary scramble that I know you guys are focusing on. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we we had the huge win last year with the heartbeat bill. You know, that's something the governor promised and, is, and worked for. And that that's not going to stop. I mean, we're going to continue working for a culture that uh, truly cherishes life across Georgia. Uh, the governor's uh, we're, we're, we'll be supporting him on his efforts for faith uh, for foster care and adoption reform. Uh, I think that's an imperative way to, to go forward and, and cherish life and, and show that the value there. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do as a state on, on religious freedom. We've got a lot of work to do as a state on school choice. Uh, one of the things we're committed to do is making sure that we've got seven more years of Governor Kemp uh, where we can uh, where we can continue to fight those battles. Uh, school choice is an issue. I think you're going to see a number of pieces of legislation this year come forward. Uh, those are going to be a, those are there's going to be a number of battles on those. ESAs is, is an issue that we've supported in the past. Educational savings accounts. Uh, I think that will be a, a bill this year. We're trying to build some critical mass to support it. Um, and I appreciate those that put in the, the effort to fight for that. Uh, a Tim Tebow bill is, a, I think, a very simple piece of legislation that we've been working for uh, that I think affects everybody. You know, if, if you decide that uh, your child's best educational route is homeschooling, uh, this bill, should it pass, would remove a barrier from that decision. It would allow your, your child to participate in extracurricular activities at their local public school, whether that be football or band or, you know, uh, acting club or whatever it is, something that your tax dollars pay for and can be an important part of your child's development would now be open to you. So would well, encourage it, your listeners to support that. Let, let me spend a minute on this because I, I get blowback occasionally, even from some conservatives, and, and I try to point out to them, your tax dollars already go to pay for these programs at the local public school. Even though you're keeping your kid home to educate them, your tax dollars are funding this stuff, so why not take advantage of them? And yet in Georgia, you can't. Yeah. Yeah, Georgia is one of the one of the minority of states now. I think 30, 34 other states have some version of a Tim Tebow bill, and Georgia's lagging behind. Uh, so we're working to fix that. We we passed the bill for the first time ever out of the Senate last year, uh, thirty four to nineteen. It's carried by Bruce Thompson. Uh, we're in the House, and that we're, we're we're having ongoing conversations. I feel good about our ability to pass that. And look, one of the things that we, I, I believe as a parent. Uh, it is incumbent on you to, to raise your child as you see fit, you know, and, and to make sure that they've got the best education and the most opportunity they have. And it's not the government's job to impose barriers upon you and your child from being able to participate in a broad array of things that can in, improve their development and help them uh, achieve the outcomes they desire. So this is something you, you can take advantage of the program or not, but it should be available to you because your tax dollars pay for it. And it can be an important part of, you know, how your child, you know, continues to develop and become a productive citizen. Now, on these school choice legislations, ESAs, Tebow, uh, school choice, it's been the Republicans have been the chief obstacle to this stuff in the state legislature in the past, not actually Democrats. Well, a little bit, a little bit of both, uh, you know, but uh, we, you're so much more diplomatic than me. <laughs> well, I think I think ESA is most I mean, all but maybe a handful of Democrats voted against it as well. So there's a lot of education that needs to go go into this issue. And you talked about rural Georgia, and I'd encourage those of you in, in rural Georgia, because a lot of your rural representatives have been opposed to it, because they hear so much from teachers and from you know the education professionals that are opposed to it because they fear for their school. 
um, we have to place the student ahead of the institution. And so a lot of times when I'm talking to a rural senator or a rural representative that are conservative and agree with us on a lot of things, they have heard from uh, op- in opposition to this 20 to 1. Um, and so for those that are listening and believe that this makes sense, that it's, it's right to you know, give uh, students a pathway to, you know, to fulfill their dreams, whatever opportunity they want to pursue, um, I'd encourage you to reach out to your state senator and state rep and say, hey, look, we, we need you to get on board with the school choice train. And I'll just take a little tangent here. This is how you begin to – this kind of thing is how you begin to win back you know, the Metro Atlanta, you know, you push, you push for school choice and all of a sudden the suburban mom that, you know, has, has occasionally abandoned, you know, Republicans or conservatives, um, you give their, that their child an opportunity to go to the school of their choice or participate in an extracurricular activity that they were being barred from. That's a huge win. And to begin to show that we care about education and healthcare, which I think the governor's done a great job of talking about, that's how you win back those moms, not by moderating, not by you know steering away from social conservative issues, but by embracing choice and, and education and providing a better way in education. Well, yeah, and you know it, it, it's not just in my mind those suburban moms. This seems to be the really the civil rights issue of of the day. And we saw black mothers when Nathan Deal pushed charter schools uh, rushing to the polls to stand with Nathan Deal on this issue against, frankly, a lot of self described black leaders. And you, you provide them a way out of some of their school situations in the Atlanta public schools and the like and and suddenly you're building a coalition yeah absolutely i mean and the reality is we've, we've got some we've got some great schools here in the state of georgia this doesn't be the schools but we've got some some that are failing and we've got some kids that for whatever reason don't fit in the local public school they just, they're either they're you know they're being bullied or there's some sort of issue or they want to pursue something that's not available to them in their in their public school it's about putting students first and uh, when, when conservatives are the ones that are championing students and are championing the family, we tend to do well. And uh, I'd encourage, I'd encourage uh, the folks down under the Gold Dome this year to embrace that and begin passing some meaningful school choice legislation. Now, before you get off here, I, I want to give you this opportunity, this platform now, r- really across the state of Georgia now, uh, to talk about Family Policy Alliance, what you guys do and how people can get involved. Yeah, and congratulations on your show, man. I mean, you and I have talked. I'm so excited about uh your your reach and the audience that you're able to to get a hold of now across the state of georgia that's great um family policy alliance we, we've been here now about three years um and i think we've been able to make a profound impact we were founded initially by focus on the family um and we are a politics policy and culture organization we want the church to be the church uh to engage in culture uh we're about winning elections and uh, electing the right people so that we can have god honoring policy uh we got behind governor kemp early uh, have been honored to support him and stand with him uh, through the heartbeat fight, through uh, through everything that he's been able to do. And we're very focused on this 2020 election cycle. You and I have talked about this. I'm very optimistic about if we if we really set ourselves to it, I think we can gain ground, not just lose, not just try to hold the line, but actually gain ground for families uh, in, in the 2020 election outcomes. And so uh, we've set some bold targets for that. And uh, we need folks to hop on board, support our organization. You can learn more about us at FamilyPolicyAlliance.com and uh, would encourage folks to really engage with us. We we need your help. We need this to be a statewide movement uh, because I believe that we can make Georgia a shining light across the country uh, on how, how families can really take back their government. Well, listen, I, I mean, I, I will just tell those of you listening right now, the Family Policy Alliance here in Georgia is my favorite conservative grassroots group in the state of Georgia. I'm not just saying that because Cole is on the phone. He knows really I think sweet, that. Man. Well, I, you know, I, I try. I, I, I try to help you, man. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, I, I appreciate you stopping by and, and taking some time, and, and we will definitely uh, highlight these issues throughout this legislative session as well because I'm with you on the school choice stuff and, and Tebow Bill and the like. Absolutely. I appreciate you. Absolutely. That's Cole Musio. He is with the Georgia Family Policy Alliance. Again, if you want to find out more, they really are my favorite. And most people don't realize outside of the metro area uh, where they've got a real good following. They're trying to grow in the state. They started just a couple of years ago here in Georgia, and uh, it's a nationwide group. They were originally affiliated with uh, Focus on the Family, and uh, we've got now Family Policy Alliance uh, groups around uh, the country in various states. They are great, great, great shop because they're not just a public policy policy white paper think tank they actually do go out and they try to find candidates who are viable not just the candidates who love jesus because you know in the south everybody loves them some jesus what they actually do 
is they go out and find candidates who love them some Jesus who can actually win credible, viable candidates who can win. I can't tell you the number of times here in Georgia and around the nation I have encountered candidates who they they love them some Jesus and God is on their side and and the Almighty is going to get them elected and God has called them to run. And you can tell this guy's kind of a crank. He's not going to win anything. But, But Jesus called him to run. No, no, you just wanted to run and decided you heard Jesus. Y'all, I'm sorry. If if Jesus ever actually audibly spoke to me, I would have to go see a shrink. Uh, Jesus rarely, it, it, it can happen, but there are way more people who think it's happening than is actually happening. Do we, we, when, when I have a conversation with Jesus in my car, it, it tends to be very one-sided. Um, but I, I, I can, I can certainly feel a, a, sometimes that he's listening. And, you know, I was telling a friend of mine the other day who's going on hard, who's going through some hard times. I said, you, you know, sometimes you just, you got to be deliberate about it. And, and you're going to think there's nobody home. There's nobody listening. Is God even real? And you just, you got to make yourself do it. Sometimes you, you just you got to force yourself to have a one sided conversation. Sometimes you, you got to yell at him uh, and, and he, he'll be OK. He understands what you're going through and, and there's a reason for it. And, and then one day he answers and oh, does he answer? And all your doubts get washed away very quickly. But I encounter candidates all the time on, on the Christian conservative spectrum and uh, that they that they just Jesus told them to run. And I'm just thinking, I, I'm, you know, I, I believe Jesus has told me a lot of things in my life, but I've never actually heard him say, Eric Erickson, this is your Lord God, and I want you to run for office. Go file your paperwork today. It doesn't work that way. Some people seem to think it does. And I don't mean to be disparaging of those who think it does, but it doesn't work that way. Um, so what Cole's group does, Family Policy Alliance, is they go out and they actually find really good Christian candidates to run for office. Uh, and and who really do want to make a values cultural shift in the country. Uh, politics is downstream from culture. They find Christian conservatives in culture and bring them into politics and make a, a virtuous cycle here. Uh, so I really do like Family Policy Alliance. Their issues tend to very much align with my issues on a social and fiscal level. I do agree with them. The casino would be bad news. We need to spend some time on that uh, when we have some time. Uh, but I encourage you, if you want to get involved with a good grassroots group in the state of Georgia, uh, you, you want to don't Donate to them. You want to you want to help them. You want to get them into your church and, and meet with people. They're great. Uh, you won't go wrong. And Cole is fantastic. It is FamilyPolicyAlliance.com is their website. And we will have him back on as the session uh, continues to wind its way through, uh, seeing exactly how our wonderful legislators are dealing with the issues of Georgia. I will come up with a recipe uh, and we'll text uh, you out a recipe, email out a recipe. What you do is you text the word recipe to 33777 and I will email you out a recipe. You'll get a text back asking for your email address. That'll subscribe you to the list, and then away we go. Um, but there's another there's another number or code word for that number you need to know. Uh, as the legislature gets underway now, this is this is actually the important one. Um, the code word is army. And let me explain this to you. You just had we just had Cole Musio on uh, from the Family Policy Alliance in Georgia, and and we tend to work uh, hand in hand on a lot of these issues. The Tebow bill, I'm actually a big supporter of. Uh, it's named after Tim Tebow. Uh, Tim Tebow was homeschooled and was able to play in after school sports at his local school because his uh, legislature had uh, had made it legal for him to go to after-school activities, even though he was homeschooled, because his parents are, you're paying the taxes. If your kid is in private school, my kids are in a a small private school, and we pay taxes for public education. If you're homeschooled, you're still paying taxes for your public education. You're paying taxes for the football field. You're paying taxes for the band. Uh, And so why can't you, and not everybody's going to do it, but some might want to go be in the marching band. You're paying the taxes for it, so why can't you do it? You should be able to do it. And if you don't want to do it, if you don't want your kid to do it, you you know, there may be a parent out there who does want their kid to be able to go play on the on the soccer team. They're they're homeschooled, but they want their kids to have some extracurricular activities. Now, uh, where I am here in in middle Georgia, we've got a great, great um, soccer facility here uh, that everybody goes to, so 
There's no worry. But in some places, you, you may want your kid to do that. Or school choice. You, you may want to help parents get out of, of failing schools. This is the civil rights issue of our time. It is an issue I think that Republicans uh, will be able to win on. And I think that uh, this is something we need to fight for. And and I do really do think I'm not opposed to sports betting in Georgia. I actually support it. Um, but casinos, I think there, there are so many studies out there not funded by casinos that show they're not really the economic boon that a lot of these legislators claim they are. So I, I would be hesitant on them. Uh, but I want you to be able to get involved. I want you to be able to reach out to your legislator, even if you disagree with me on the issue, still make it easy for you to reach out to the legislator and say, you know what? I actually disagree with him on this. I support it or I oppose it. He he opposes, I support, I support, or he supports, I, I oppose. I, I want to make it easy for any of you. We don't have to agree on the issues for us to agree that part of my job should be to help you be a better constituent. And get you educated on the issues, even if we don't agree on stuff. Uh, the way I do that is I have an email and text messaging list that makes it easy for you to reach out. And the way you do it is you text the word ARMY to 33777, just on, on your smartphone, on your on your old flip phone. The number that you text to, the number is 33777. And all you do is you send the word ARMY, A-R-M-Y, for the conservative activist ARMY. And you'll get a email, you'll get a text back asking for your email address, type it in, God help you if you have a flip phone, uh, but type it in and suddenly you become an activist, you become a political activist and I make it very easy for you. I will send you an email and say, this is an issue pending before the legislature in Georgia right now. Here's what you need to know about it. Click this link and I will connect you to your state legislator and you can tell them yes or no. If you want to support the Tebow bill, this is a way for you to do it. If you want to oppose the Tebow bill, here's how you can do it. You want to support the casino or oppose the casino, here's what you here are the facts that I, I the facts I think you need to know. And here's the link. Click this link and it'll connect you by phone or by email or by tweet or by Facebook message. My job is not just to entertain you. It's not just to make you laugh. It's not just to make you think. It's to make you be a good constituent. Because frankly, these clowns work for you. You pay the taxes that pay the bills for our state legislator. They're up in Atlanta right now. They're going to the strip clubs with the lobbyists and having way too much fun, and they need to be working for you, and I want to make them work for you. And the best way to do that is to make you easily be able to connect them. So uh, text the word ARMY to 33777. Um, get on the list. And as these bills wind their way to the legislature, and besides, you'll be the most informed member of your circle of friends. You'll be able to tell everybody else what's going on. They'll make they'll be relying on you. And I'll talk to you guys tomorrow.